Hey everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. I appreciate it. I'm Kent Dunn with Cessna Flyer and Piper Flyer Associations. Today we have Ke Kevin Garrison, contributing editor with Cessna Flyer and Piper Flyer, and his topic of conversation tonight will be fuel management, the source, force, and course. Here is Kevin. Uh, there we go. I'm unmuted. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. Let me share my screen and get that started. Make sure I get the right screen. Ha! It worked, kind of. All right. Welcome to the Source Force course. I'll explain what this means in a minute. I'd also like to welcome you to my humble, my humble uh, writer's garret here in Lexington, Kentucky, a home office, uh, you know, where all the magic happens. And uh, it's weird speaking to you this way. I've done it before and it was weird last time because I'm used to seeing your lovely faces and how you respond and who gets up and leaves and things like that. And I'm just going to guess that everybody's really enjoying the heck out of this and we're just having a wonderful time and I'm going to press on. This course, this uh, webinar, of course, is brought to you by Cessna Flyer and Piper Flyer Associations. And I'll go back to Cessna Flyer. It's a real hard uh, uh, web address. It's basically CessnaFlyer.org or PiperFlyer.org. And I, uh, I encourage you to go there and, and see what they're about. It's not just the magazine. They do tremendous service uh, to their mem for their members. And uh, I've been proud to be a part of them for off and on for, I think, 15 years or more. So uh, really good people. And I hope you, if you're not already a member, I hope you give them a look. And uh, that's the only commercial I think I have for this thing. So there you go. I'm your presenter. Uh, you already know my name, Kevin Garrison. Um, I was a line boy in Lakeland, Florida from uh, 71 through 74. Uh, before 71, I was an airport bum. I'd bicycle out there uh, from, uh, I guess I was 11. And eventually they got so tired of me playing in their airplanes, they offered me a job. So not only uh, am I familiar with fuel and I burned bazillions of gallons of fuel as an airline pilot, um, I've been covered in fuel. Uh, I've been uh, soaked in fuel. I used to come home every night smelling like fuel, and I loved it. I had a wonderful time there. And a lot of people, uh, not a lot of people, some people ask me what my favorite job was, you know, and uh, this job as a line boy was right up there even with being an airline captain. I had so much fun, you would not believe it. And that's for another day, I'll tell you all about the fun. Okay, the reason I came up with the title Source, Force, and Course um, is based on the DC-8. That's the NASA DC-8 there. Um, we, uh, I, I worked for ABX Air until last year as a flight instructor uh, slash pilot examiner. I was an examiner on the DC-9 and I instructed on the 7-6 and the DC-9, but they also did the DC-8. And one of the DC-8s that we uh, trained the crew on uh, was the NASA uh, DC-8. As a matter of fact, one of our instructors flies engineer on that. I left that job a few years ago, though. And the reason for source, force, course was from my flight engineer days. Um, that's your basic DC-8 flight engineer panel. Um, give you a second to soak all the glory in. Uh, the, um, the source, force, course thing is when they taught us the fuel system. Uh, I don't think they said this when I learned the 7-2 as an engineer. This is my second airplane I was a flight engineer on. But the, uh, that's how we would move fuel. We'd have to have a source. We'd have to have fuel somewhere in a tank. Uh, we'd have to move it somehow with force. Uh, that would be uh, you know, tank uh, pumps, fuel pumps. And uh, the course, uh, you know, where are we sending it? Uh, on the DC-8, the fuel panel uh, had a pointer. I don't think. I don't think the mouse works as a pointer on this thing. But the uh, bottom uh, third of the, of the engineer panel is the fuel panel. The little handles with the X's and the big uh, light bulbs and the dials and gizmos and all that. Each uh, of the four engines on the DC-8 had a, a main fuel tank and an aux fuel tank. And we had a few center tanks too. I think you see those in the center. 
again, it's been 40 years since I've been on this airplane, not 40, 35. So I may be getting some of this wrong. I, I didn't go to DC at recurrent just for this slide. So I apologize if I'm getting it wrong. But I do remember that this was the only airliner I ever flew on that you could physically move fuel. I could move fuel from the left wing tip all the way to the right wing tip. Uh, other airliners, you can't actually move the fuel and fill up a tank uh, from another tank. You just uh, choose where the fuel goes to be burned. Uh, we'll get into that in a, in a little while. We're not going to get real deep into airline stuff. Um, I have a few pages of it just for your, an FYI in case you're interested in it. And uh, I, uh, I don't like to dwell on my brown hair days, you know, when I was young and had a mustache. And, but I just uh, found that an interesting concept. It's really basic, but it kind of, when it's bumpy and it's late at night and you're in bad weather and you, you and, and the DC-8 had terrible lighting, they only had the red lighting, uh, it's nice to have a little uh, gouge to go to when you're trying to move fuel around. The other thing about the DC-8 before I leave this slide is this is pretty much the only airliner you could totally screw the fuel up and just cause a total disaster. Uh, the way you see it now, I think they have all the cross feeds open, all the fill valves open. And that's what you would do uh, when everything goes to poop, because it just makes the entire airplane one fuel tank. Of course, I could be wrong about that. Like I said, it's been three decades or more. One more note uh, about tonight. Um, I'm not a, a chemical engineer or a petrochemical engineer. Um, I gave a talk on aviation fuel for AOPA about 10 years ago in Houston, and I found that very quickly I didn't know very much about fuel because I was talking to like 100 petrochemical engineers. So I won't try to teach you chemistry, and I'm going to stay away from a few subjects uh, like auto fuel STCs, uh, other fuels like hydrogen electric, the, uh, the warp drive. Uh, whatever, uh, we'll just concentrate on today, or this evening, or this afternoon, depending on where you are, on plain old avgas and, and jet fuel. And that's plenty, we'll have plenty to cover. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe we'll cover some of this stuff. I think I have a snarky comment about auto fuel later. But uh, other than that, I'm sure some of you, many of you may have it, and you may love it. So I won't, I won't be too snarky. Okay. From the NAL report down the bottom left there, uh, you know, the safety report that comes out, they, uh, the numbers uh, for fuel accidents um, were um, 70 a year. And that was three or four years ago was the, the study that I found. And uh, changing pages here, there we go. And, and I think that's misleading because I think a lot of other accidents are caused by fuel conditions. I think people who are, who are low on fuel or are having trouble with fuel maybe hurry up a little too much and make bad decisions. So these numbers are just people who uh, their engines quit uh, because it didn't have adequate fuel or had the wrong kind of fuel. Uh, but the, the study actually said, I, I kind of was, <laughs> it kind of confirmed what I thought. Uh, over half of the uh, fuel related accidents are just bad planning, uh, just bad head work. And, and that's pretty much what we're going to discuss tonight is the head work part of it. Um, very few are, are because the gauge was wrong or a pump didn't work or, you know, whatever. And many, I added this uh, in. I'm not the only one to think of this, but I think most fuel accidents happen uh, due to magical or wishful thinking. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later too, but you just, um, you've gotten away with it before um, or whatever, or you just don't want to believe what's happening. Real basic basics here. And we'll, we'll go over uh, some of these uh, in more detail. You know, the right kind of fuel. And uh, that almost goes without saying, and we'll get into the different types of fuel in a while. Uh, and we'll hit this again too, but a lot of aircraft now are uh, powered by diesel engines and they are on the same ramp as aircraft that are powered uh, by, uh, or fueled by avgas. And we'll get into some safety uh, uh, procedures that keep those two separate. But it's not unusual uh, for an aircraft that looks like it takes uh, avgas to actually require jet A, and, uh, or maybe even the other way around. So 
that's not, it didn't used to be that much of a concern because it used to be pretty much any aircraft you saw on a general aviation ramp, uh, unless it was obviously a jet, took, uh, took avgas. The only problem is you might've given it the wrong kind of avgas. Uh, enough quantity, we'll talk about uh, the legalities and what you need. Uh, you gotta have enough. Uh, <laughs> I know it sounds pretty basic. And we'll talk about debris and water. Um, I think water may be a little bit oversold, but we'll talk about it anyway. It's a very good habit, uh, you know, something the tanks, uh, things like that. And um, if you have it on board and it's not ballast fuel, you need to have a way of getting to it and using it. Uh, that's kind of rare, but you know, imagine the boost pump and and your tank doesn't move the fuel and it's stuck. Okay, Captain Will Shakespeare said it best. And um, there are way, way, way more different types of fuel than the four I'm showing here. Avgas, uh, 80, 80 octane, we can pretty much write off. I don't think it's being produced anywhere. Well, from my studies, it said it wasn't being produced anywhere right now. Um, it's, it's gone away. And uh, they didn't say 100 uh, Avgas is gone, although I'll be darned if I found it anywhere. Um, it, it's probably either gone or it's on its way out. I, haven't, I don't get around a lot, but I do get around it. I haven't seen it. Maybe you guys could comment on that. The one we all burn and love and just think is wonderful <laughs> is the 100 uh, low lead. That's the most uh, common, I think. And we'll talk about the, uh, the Jet A in, in a few minutes. Uh, they're all color coded, as you know, from taking your private and uh, something you may not know that I used to just glory in when I was a brand new CFI was that if you take 50% um, of 80 octane and mix it with 50% of 100 octane, it turns clear just like jet fuel. And I don't think that's true anymore, but that just, you know, back when I was making four bucks an hour instructing, that was just amazing. On the jet fuel side, um, there are tons of different kinds of um, of jet fuel, uh, you know, from JP4, I could hold a whole, a whole webinar just on jet fuel. Um, jet A is depicted there. Uh, jet A1 is frequently in use. It has a, a little higher um, temperature point. Um, and uh, if anybody, I, I wanted to review what octane means. This is about as deep in the science as I'll get. It's uh, basically the pressure at which the fuel will spontaneously combust in an engine. The higher the octane, the more stable uh, it is at higher, in higher compression engines. Uh, that is just putting a light sugar coating on the donut, I know. Um, for historical stuff, I do remember from my studies of Jimmy Doolittle, I used to write about him a lot, that prior to World War II, he worked for Shell Oil. But even before then, he was a big proponent of 100 octane because we, we didn't have high compression military engines um, in the mid 30s. And by the time the war came, due to his efforts and other people's efforts, uh, we did. And they needed to have 100 octane fuel or better to operate. Okay, a little, uh, if it won't fit, you must quit. The nozzles are different sizes, and you guys may remember this. Um, the jet uh, overwing jet fillers are bigger. Uh, the jet nozzles are wider, and you can see the dimensions there. Uh, and of course, they have a, a cautionary tail down there that a lot of the, uh, the some of the jet nozzles are, are small, like the Avgas nozzles, uh, which means you can put you can easily put Avgas into a jet uh, fuel tank but you can't put um, as easily put jet fuel into an Avgas tank. Um, I've never run into that even when I was a line crew guy, but uh, apparently that's a good safety feature. The, the real truth though is, and, and you, know, you don't need to go around measuring nozzles, they're color coded as well. And you, you know, most of the fuel we get now is from self-serve. And I have another rant I could go on about that, but it, um, it's pretty obvious, but I thought I'd cover that. Almost every jet I've ever flown uses this, a single point nozzle, single point fueling. When I was a line crew guy, we had to change the nozzle in and out because if a jet star came in, uh, that was uh, 
that was an over the wing thing. And about half the jets we fueled back then needed an uh, over the wing nozzle and the other half used single point. And uh, I have a funny story about that, but we don't really have time for my funny stories. But I did that changing the nozzle one day, I took a really nice jet A bath and uh, it itches, it really itches. Also, um, when you do see the uh, single point in use, you'll probably see it in use more on airliners. That's probably, unless you're flying a jet that has single point and there's a, a fuel panel under the leading edge of the wing they go to, and that's the fueling station. And on most aircraft, I've had them on both sides. On most aircraft, it's on the right wing because they want it on the opposite side of the cargo doors. Am I getting that right? I don't, I don't know. It's been a while and I'm getting very old, but. Okay, let's talk about the classifications. Every, every airplane I've flown, I think, has had a little bit of unusable fuel. Um, trying to remember on the Cessna 150, it was 13.2 gallons per side. I think it was 0.2 unusable. Maybe you guys could correct me. Um, and that's just fuel you can't get to, um, to burn because of the uh, ge geometry of the tank or how, how it's built. It's really not, <clears throat> excuse me, it's really not unusable because of your pitch angle or anything like that. Although if you're very low on fuel, most POHs, pilot operating handbooks, will tell you to limit steep banks and steep pitch um, maneuvers because you could uncover the, uh, the fuel um, inlet thing in the tank and run out of gas, even though you have gas in your tanks. But if you get in that shape, um, don't tell them you know me because I don't want you to get that low on fuel. Anyway, you know, you're familiar with that. You, uh, unusable fuel is also in, in, uh, in the operating weight of the airplane and it's an airline lingo. It's part of the uh, zero fuel weight along with the other stuff, other fluids uh, that go with the airplane on airline. That would be potable water, toilet tanks, you know, oil, stuff like that. Not coffee, but maybe it should have been. Ballast fuel, you guys probably almost never run into this. Uh, usually this happens on longer fuselage aircraft that are jets. Um, they, and usually also it's on uh, aircraft that have swept wings because the, um, the, the uh, CG changes as fuel burns. And I'm trying to remember if the, uh, they load that if you're awful light. I remember they'd load ballast fuel on us if we almost had no passengers because it would, it would help us with the weight and balance. And we were not allowed to burn that fuel. Uh, you know, if I was on fire or if I'm over the ocean and there were sharks beneath me, I'd probably burn the fuel and try to control the airplane. But honest to goodness, you're not supposed to burn ballast fuel. Uh, which leads to another uh, interesting thing to me, at least, because I ran into this a lot. I know you guys do it. You may do it weekly if you fly every week. That's your tanker fuel. In uh, Kentucky, I'm based in Lexington and fuel's a dollar more than it is anywhere else. So I generally drop in and, and fill up at a closer airport, Cynthiana or Georgetown. And uh, I'm tankering then, really. We, um, the, the definition is you're carrying your fuel to get back out. And you may not be carrying enough, enough fuel to total, like say if you're doing a, a trip from, uh, let's say Lexington to Atlanta, and you have the capability of flying both directions with one tank of gas with enough reserves, and the fuel is $4 more a gallon in Atlanta, well, you probably tanker down there and, and just carry your fuel down there. Tankering has costs because you're, uh, you weigh a lot more when you're carrying the extra fuel. So you're, you're burning more fuel to keep the airplane in the air and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, we did it in, at my airline, uh, at my first airline, um, we did it a lot in the eighties. Uh, and I won't get into the politics of it, but Florida came up with a really onerous fuel tax. And I think it was for airliners only, but I mean, it was expensive as all get out. So I don't remember buying, picking up much fuel in Florida. We'd go, most of the flights I did back then were, you know, DC nine stuff and, uh, MD-88 stuff, but Atlanta to Sarasota and back, we'd carry all our own fuel so we didn't have to buy it in Florida. And I don't know if they did it for political reasons. They said it was cost, but um, anyway, the tankering, if you're tankering, you can burn the fuel. And that was nice going to Florida too, because if the weather was awful, 
I don't know if I ever burned much tankered fuel, but I could if I needed to hold for an extra hour. I, I'd, I had all kinds of gas. Very comfortable feeling to have an extra two or three hours worth of fuel when we generally um, would uh, plan much tighter than that. Because as I said, carrying fuel costs money. It does on your airplane too, but we don't usually think about that. We, uh, you know, I have four hours of fuel on my airplane. I top it off when I'm done flying. I don't, I don't really do a lot of super planning except on cross countries. Speaking of planning, how much fuel legally and morally and whatever do you need? Um, we'll talk VFR first. That's the tightest restriction, actually. Um, I'll bring, I'll bring up this note too. I know I did it on my 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 last webinar on, on IFR holding, and I hope a few of you caught that. And you probably, if you did, you probably are wondering and marveling at how much I went on and on about fuel being time. Uh, the FAA thinks fuel is time. They they set the rules not on how much fuel you have, but how much fuel you have in terms of time you can fly. Uh, real basic stuff. Um, VFR. Remember, it's a destination plus 30 minutes. Easy peasy. That gives you a lot of range if you're going to make it that tight. And if you are, I hope you're really good at fuel planning because that's pretty tight for me. Uh, it's fuel at normal consumption. Uh, you know, you, you get it off your uh, performance pages. And uh, I'm thinking, I'm an old guy, so I'm thinking of the paper pages, but I'm sure your computers can do that for you. And you do it for, for planned winds, um, because obviously if you have a 100 knot headwind or a 50 knot headwind, you're going to burn more fuel. It's going to take more time, but it doesn't account for unforecast things. Uh, and we'll go into a few of those problems in a minute, but that can, uh, that can really bite you in the behind if you're tight on fuel. And we'll, we'll talk about how to handle that in a little bit. IFR. And uh, for all you instrument guys and, and, and gals out there, we'll just do a quick review. Uh, you complete the flight to the first airport of intended landing and you shoot the approach. It doesn't say that in the, it doesn't really say that in the regs. When we get into part 121, it does say that, but in, in this, in the regular straight up FAA regs, I don't believe it says that because I copied the regs right out of the book. Uh, then you fly from that airport to an alternate airport and then um, fly for 45 minutes at normal cruising speed. And then of course that note about helicopters and uh, that still leaves you a hundred different ways to uh, get yourself in trouble. Uh, first of all, the, uh, if you're going to a busy airport, the flight to the first airport may take you an extra 30 minutes to get in if they're not even holding, if they're vectoring and you're number 20 on the ILS to go to a big airport or if you're holding over the outer marker, waiting for the guy who just shot the approach in front of you at, a, at an, a, an untowered airport to cancel IFR so you can shoot the approach, that'll add time. Uh, flight to the airport, the alternate airport, well, you have to decide to go there. You have to miss, then you have to uh, decide. And if I was teaching an IFR seminar, I would have, uh, today I would have told you that's part of the approach briefing. If, you know, weather looks tight, if we miss, here's where I plan to go. You might even miss that controller just to give the person the heads up fly for 45 minutes of normal cruising and that, that begs the question what altitude you know if you're in a tur if you're in a jet or a turboprop the higher you go the better your fuel mileage is well if you're in the northeast quarter you may not get higher they may keep you down to three or four thousand feet or, or or a low altitude to get to your alternate especially if the alternate's close by and uh, the, that burns into your 45 minutes normal cruising speed at a normal altitude for a turboprop or even a, a turbocharged aircraft is considerably less than it is at low altitude. There's my worry work, and I've covered some of these. Um, you're gonna, you know, on the IFR and the VFR, you're gonna go around, you're gonna have missed approaches. Uh, taxiing out, ground delays, um, you, they happen not so much for us, but they do happen in, in big towns. You may have a, uh, a release time that you're waiting for. And uh, that means you're taxing and you're burning fuel. The winds could change uh, while you're en route. I mentioned that. Uh, your fuel flow could change. Uh, you know, you're using, you may be using figures out of your POH. 
or have your computerized, you know, your, your robot assistant, whatever we have nowadays, maybe whispering in your ear what the fuel flow is supposed to be, but you may have old engines there, or you may have engines that aren't efficiently tuned that are burning more fuel. Uh, you, your routing can change, uh, VFR, probably not, but you could if you have to go around weather. Uh, and then of course, malfunctions like fuel gauges and things like that. Could, could give you problems and you know i'm preaching to the choir here but what i'm trying to get at is i'd be really uh, concerned if i was doing a vfr flight and i was going to land with only 30 minutes of fuel in the tanks i was planning on landing that one uh, and we'll go i'll cover this i'll beat this horse a little bit more here in a minute because it's important um, with 60 percent of the accidents being poor planning um you know the salesman said the airplane could go 830 nautical miles how come I flamed out at 805 nautical miles and, and, you know, I'm not saying you're that dumb, but somebody must be because there's 70 accidents a year. So here we go. Okay. Now we're getting into a little graduate level stuff and I won't waste a lot of time on this, but I wanted you to have an, I wanted you to have an idea of, um, uh, how airlines do it specifically, uh, international. We, we had different, um, fuel requirements. Uh, they added uh, flag fuel. You've probably heard about that. Uh, and they, there is a, a whole bunch of stuff we could talk about there. But primarily, I just wanted to let you know that they, we had to carry enough fuel to be at our, uh, right at our um, no return point, or we call it the equal time point over the ocean, whatever ocean we were over and uh, lose uh, pressurization and descend to a level that our passengers could uh, breathe, you know, around 10,000 feet and go to an alternate and have enough fuel to get there. Which means there's gonna be, you know, quite a bit more fuel. And the holding requirements and things like that are different than in the land of the free. And uh, we, uh, the international fly I did was primarily in the 777 and, except for one really bad weather day in England. Um, it was an unusually bad weather day in England. Um, we didn't have to worry about fuel. Well, that one trip we had to divert into Shannon and get fuel. But usually on the 777, we'd leave Atlanta for London with a third of a tank of gas. And we had more than enough. So it had lots of range. Speaking of two engine airplanes over water, we'll just touch on this ETOPS extended twin let me see if I can read it. I used to know what this was. Extended range twin engine operational performance standards. We just called it ETOPS. And quite honestly, until I looked this up the other day, I'd forgotten what it stood for. But we, we used to hit this pretty hard because two engine over water uh, didn't used to happen. It used to be a minimum of three engines if you're going to fly people over water. And then they changed it when the 7.6 came out. And we won't hit this hard, but they are, uh, once again, they want you... Uh, to be able to divert single engine this time with a damaged engine with more drag, uh, lower cruise altitudes. Uh, they even fold in uh, icing conditions, uh, adequate alternate airports. Um, and uh, a bunch of stuff, you know, there's the 180 rule, the 240 rule. We won't get into that because we're not going to deal with that. I will say though, that um, the, um, one, I had one trip on the 777 where we, we had to shut down an engine because it was damaged. I think we were around 30 west going to Europe and uh, we had to divert to Keflavik. And I think it was about an hour and a half to Keflavik on one engine. And that was a long hour and a half um, <laughs> to, a, to a really crappy weather in Keflavik. But no war stories here. But I, I did want to mention that... Um, one of the things that they added, and I, I just, I thought this was neat because the original 767 came with one fuel cross feed, like most airplanes do. Um, ETOPS airplanes have two fuel cross feeds. On the 777, it was uh, called the forward and aft cross feeds. The uh, ER, the 76 ER, which is all showing you how old I am because those are old airplanes now, also came with two cross feeds because the cross feed was critical. If you lost an engine and couldn't cross feed fuel from the dead engine side and burn it on the good engine side, you wouldn't last very long. Either you'd run out of gas or you probably, with the heavy loads of fuel we carried, you'd lose control of the airplane. Uh, uh, I think the the out of the lateral limit on the seven six. If I'm and I, I'm pulling this right out of my rear end, I think it was a thousand pounds. I know the seven two. It was a thousand pounds. But anyway, 
maximum fuel, something you don't think about much, but uh, maybe you don't. Although on my, I have a Cessna 140 that I fly in. I usually wait till I burn, you know, five or six or seven gallons off before I put people in it just to stay legal because I'm a pretty hefty guy. So I guess that would be maximum fuel. The, uh, it's the most fuel you can carry and still legally make a takeoff. You don't exceed your takeoff weight. Uh, in the transport world, that would, could also be the takeoff weight for that runway. Uh, runway um, performance in, in the air transport aircraft is predicated on weight, uh, not runway. Well, runway length fits into it, but it, it's, it's primarily you would you would ask, do we weigh? Are, are we light enough to use this runway? Because it's a weight limitation. And speaking of weight, I forgot to mention a few slides ago an important distinction. Excuse me, while I sip on my water here. Um, you and I in the general aviation world, we think of fuel and quantities as gallons. And we know that a gallon of avgas weighs six pounds, give or take. Um, in the air transport world, in the airline world, and probably in the biz jet world, although I never was in that world, um, fuel is measured in pounds, not gallons. We would carry uh, you know, 65,000 pounds to go to Europe. I have no idea. I, should, I used to remember how much jet fuel weighed, but I would have to look it up. I don't know. We would just it would all be weight. Uh, if I needed fuel because I thought the weather was going to be bad and they hadn't given me enough to get in, I'd call the dispatcher and we'd haggle over how much extra fuel I could put on. And by the way, at my airline, that never was argued. The only argument was uh, it wasn't they didn't want to give me the fuel. We might be limited by maximum landing weight at destination, which is the, the bottom note here. That's another limitation. If you carry so much fuel and you still have most of it on board when you get there, you might be too heavy to land something you probably don't run into on your airplanes. One last thing you probably don't run into is a, um, jet A can, the water product particles in the jet A can freeze and clog up um, filters and kill engines. And we won't waste a lot of time on this, uh, except that in some cases there's an actual Mach number uh, given to the crew. Um, transpolar flights deal in this uh, where you have to maintain a certain Mach to keep the total air temperature up warm enough to uh, keep the fuel from freezing. And that actually works because I've done a couple of those flights. And total air temperature, for those that you don't remember, the definition is in the bottom left. It's basically um, static air temperature corrected for ram rise, and that's the friction of the air hitting the uh, probe. And if the friction of the air hitting the probe makes the temperature go up, well, the friction of the air hitting the wing makes that temperature go up as well. Uh, there's also fuel heat and stuff like that on the, in the airplane, on aircraft engines. Uh, they use 13-stage bleed air, but we won't get into that tonight. I'll put a can of Pris there just for your <laughs> enjoyment. I mean, canvas slide without a picture. But I thought this is significant. Uh, Jet A uh, freezes at minus 40. Uh, Jet A 147. Look at Avgas, 100 minus 100. I doubt you're ever going to run into frozen fuel. I hope not. If you're, if you're burning nav gas, um, if the fuel's more contaminated, it'll freeze sooner. Uh, so I don't really think in our world, um, we're, we need to worry much. I, I burn nav gas, you guys mostly do probably. And uh, that's almost a non-problem. The Prist, I understand a lot of times now, the Prist is actually in the fuel. We used to sell it for, uh, when I was a line boy, back when I wore the jumpsuit, I forget how much it was, but we sold it separately and it had a little nozzle. You guys may have worked with that. And the, the little Pris nozzle went over the jet fuel nozzle and you had to push the button while you were running the fuel. And it was a big, especially in Lear jets. Lear jets seemed to really want to have Pris. I guess they had no, they had no fuel heat for their engines or something, but that was the deal. And uh, I can't remember the last time I saw a can of real Prist, but maybe you guys have them. You flip through my pages here while we're, you're enjoying that airplane. That airplane is one I flew. I must have had, I guess that airplane was November 54137. It's an Aztec. I flew in Tallahassee for years. I must have 1,500 hours. I took my ATP check ride in that airplane and somebody flew it and sunk it. And I ran, you know how sometimes you look up end numbers if you're like a lonely person like me and don't have a life and at night you're looking up and numbers to see what happened to your old your old flames your old airplanes i looked that up and it just it really made me sad to see that thing underwater but it was it, that's that's the one it said it was so anyway 
more about me, but um, probably a bad idea to look up airplanes you've flown, I guess. The one I soloed and got wrecked. Anyway, well, moving on, sumps. You can't have a fuel talk about aviation without talking about sumps. I have had in my, the little airplane that I own, I drain the sumps a little bit every time I fly. I've had the plane for five years and I, and I keep it in a hangar. And I don't think I've ever had it out in the rain very much. And I always fill it up when I come in. I don't think I've ever found any water in my fuel with the sumps. And it, it isn't to say I'm not gonna find any tomorrow when I go out or that I'm gonna stop doing it. The, the habit of sumping the airplane when I pre-flight it is so ingrained in me, I'd feel really uncomfortable if I didn't do it. You know, that and checking fuel caps and all the other stuff we do. If you get into a deep habit like that, just keep doing it because, um, you know, it's a good safety thing. And in my airplane, since it's old, I always want to make sure the, the little sump isn't leaking too. So that's part of my walk around. And the, uh, of course, you remember from your lessons, your primary lessons that the uh, fuel at the lowest part of the airplane is where you're most likely to find contamination, water contamination. On my airplane, that's the carburetor bowl and other airplanes, it's lower than that. You have a little handle to pull and um, stuff like that. But there you go. That's a, uh, I guess I don't have one of those. That's a, a water separating thing there. And I wanted to touch on that too. Um, looks like whoever's doing it, I can't see how much fuel's in there in that picture. Um, looks like they plan to put a lot of fuel in that thing. It's awful big. Um, and I've seen people do this and I, you guys could correct me. I'm, I'm probably totally wrong on this, but when I sump fuel, I get rid of it and I'll show you how I do it in a minute. I don't, but I've seen people, they trust that, that thing so much. They just pour it back in the tank. And again, I'm probably being an ancient pilot, but if you just sumped it, why don't you pour it back in the tank? I just, anyway, uh, I'm sure that's what it's for. And it's supposed to help the uh, ecology and, and I'll, next slide after this next slide, I'll talk about that. But, that, I just wonder about that. Anyway. Oh, and, and back here, we look for color, um, consistency, um, you know, the, the old bugaboo, um, is it jet fuel or not? And we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, we'll talk about uh, fueling security and uh, I'll nag you about that. But again, this is a ritual. It's kind of like, um, when I was with the airline, when I was an engineer and a co-pilot, I did a walk around every leg and I would always, when we had money and they hadn't laid off the mechanics, I always passed the mechanic going the other way. We both did a walk around and we hardly ever, I think in my whole career, I found maybe three things out of 20,000 hours of flying. It's a ritual, but it's a good ritual, you know, and this is too. Um, I keep doing it, even though so far I've been lucky I haven't had any problems with it. We talked about testing your fuel and, you know, the kid obviously took a sip of fuel. Uh, I can't tell the difference in smell between different kinds of avgas. I can certainly tell the difference between jet A and avgas. Uh, the touch test, I think AOPA calls it the napkin test where, uh, you know, if you put it on a piece of paper, paper towel, a little drop of fuel, jet, jet fuel's oily and it'll stay there. Avgas will evaporate fairly quickly. Uh, we talked about the visual test and uh, of course the kid did the, test, the taste test. And you know, from the second slide in this thing, I was 16 when I started being a line boy. So I'm not going to tell you I never took the taste test. And I will tell you they do taste differently, but I don't think I would do that anymore. It didn't, it just seemed like a fun thing to do back then, but it was the seventies. We did a lot of fun stuff. Anyway, here's the ecology part. In the ancient old days, when I learned how to fly, we would sump the tank and just dump it on the ramp. And there you are. And we don't do that anymore. And I, I mentioned the pouring it back in the tank. And if you're comfortable with that, go for it. I don't see anything unsafe about that. I'm just a little, got the heebie-jeebies about that. What we do, it, what I do is I have a little can, a little fuel can, I, I put it in. And uh, that way I can, you know, I usually put it in the lawnmower. Um, it burns a little hotter than car gas in the lawnmower, but it works. And I haven't melted any spark plugs yet. So the little airport lawnmower, it gets my sump gas. And I would just do that. It's, we're, we're way past the time when, where people are dumping fuel on ramps. So that, that's the only thing that you know, I and Woodsy are going to harp on about. Um, 
it's just it's a bad it's a bad thing if other people see you do it because it kind of speaks towards your attitude aha here we are here we are in your world now self-service fuel i've often said that i've never seen a service business more eager to not be of service than fbo's but that's another rant i think it's in my next column and uh anyway we're all using self-service fuel uh, I found recently that it's important to call ahead if you're going to use self-service fuel to make sure it's working. In Lexington, Kentucky now, see two out of the three airports around me, well, actually counting Lexington, three out of four of the airports around me haven't had uh, self-service fuel that worked for the past week or two. I have no idea why. Actually, in Georgetown, I know why. But it's not a given that you're going to fly in at night to some lonesome town and the self-service fuel is going to work. So it's worth a phone call. And, and the reason that I'm saying you should call is I don't want you overflying or stopping with uh, low fuel and deciding to press on because you couldn't get fuel. So maybe we'll make it to the next airport. That's not good. So anyway, part of the planning, part of the 60%. <laughs> self-serve i call it the static line that's actually a misnomer i think it's called the ground line uh they actually you know people passengers of mine in my little airplanes and when i instruct now wonder about that because we don't ground our cars um but then again we don't we don't drive our cars over 100 miles an hour through precipitation and build up static as much and there's probably a bunch of other reasons too i will tell you that when i was a line boy back in slide two I was gently, uh, gingerly carrying a ground uh, wire uh, up to a Huey that was, the rotor was still going. We used to have double green stamp days in Lakeland uh, and all the, the army guys would come in and we, sometimes we'd have 20 Hueys on the ramp buying jet fuel because they could get green stamps and get stuff for their houses. And I came, I approached this Huey and I think I got within a little bit less than a foot of it. And then I got jolted back because the electricity jumped out of the skid and knocked me back. So it is a thing. So I encourage you to use it. Other things you need to think about. And I remember this the other day, I hadn't chalked my airplane. I'm up on the wing and I'm pushing on it. My airplane's slowly going backwards. It would have been a really neat comedy thing. A uh, ladder, uh, a lot of these self-service ladders aren't very good. And when I say, please take your time to do it safely and correctly, I know you're gonna do that. But uh, something came up the other day, uh, my friend, um, Jamie Beckett down in Florida had a really good article in General Aviation News. I hadn't thought of this, but as CFIs, uh, flight instructors, I've always trained my students to how to use a self-service pump. And at first I thought it was silly, but then I realized, well, I grew up pumping fuel. So I'm, I was, got pretty good at it by the time I graduated high school. A lot of people have never pumped fuel in an airplane. And the self-service thing is kind of daunting and the, ho the hose reel is weird and all that. Um, if you're a CFI out there, think about that. Um, you know, bigger flight schools, you don't have an opportunity that much to fuel, but take your time and show your students at least once how to operate a self-service fuel pump because they're going to be doing it in the real world. And uh, it's way easier if they're taught, way safer too. You can hear what you rich guys that are buying full service. Um, when my back hurts, I buy full service. Now, I'm not saying not to trust your line crew, but I don't, I love the guys, but I don't trust them. And I was glad when I was a line crew guy that people didn't trust me. I always want to be present when they're fueling. Usually if I'm out of town, uh, before I put the airplane to bed, I want to have it fueled if they're still open. Um, and that not only does that cut down on condensation overnight in the tanks, but I was there watching them fuel and I can check the, the caps and all that kind of stuff. And uh, double checking fuel caps, they should not be upset that you do that. And you certainly should do that. There's no better way to lose fuel in the air than not have a fuel cap on. And I'm living proof of that. I've had that happen to me. Um, actually, the fuel cap kind of crapped out. But anyway, here's something we, we did when I was a professional pilot. And I encourage you to do this if you're not already doing it. If you're putting an airplane to bed at night, either at home or on a layover when you're away, take the time when they're getting ready to fuel it. Do a quick walk around. Um, you might find, um, and not just stuff they broke. You know, I'm kind of making a snarky comment there. Uh, we, uh, with my airlines, we would do a quick post-flight uh, walk around just to see if there's something that needed fixing before we went out in the morning. You know, uh, not a bad idea for you guys too. If you come up on something, you could make some calls and, you know, be ahead of the game.
Of course, I know you want to get in the hotel van or go see your family, but it's worth 10 minutes of your time. It's certainly worth it to make sure, excuse me, to watch them fuel it. Um, not only do you get the same kind of, you know, you want to make sure you get the right kind of fuel and all that kind of stuff, but you get to know the line crew. And I think when I was a line crew guy, I tended to take better care of airplanes to people I had just talked to, the people that threw me the keys and yelled at me and left. Anyway. Okay. I talked about overflying. Um, some people overfly airports where they can get fuel because they think it's too expensive. The fuel planning aids we have that talk, that show you the fuel at different places, the fuel prices at different places, that's very valuable. I use that. But if I need fuel, I'm never going to overfly a field to get cheaper fuel. I'm just going to go get the daggum fuel. Um, it's just not worth it. It's, it's a false economy. The, the thing about um, domestic flying especially is um, if, you, if you put down a yardstick on a sectional chart and draw a line of your, your route, you're going to probably count 20, depending on how far you're flying, you probably count 10, 15, 20 air, airports within gliding distance of your route. And you know, most of those probably have fuel. So there's really no excuse, especially VFR, there's really no excuse to run out of fuel. You're flying over hundreds of gas stations. Um, I have a note here about auto gas, and I won't go into that, except um, auto gas chemically is, is different um, than avgas, and you guys that have the STCs know that, so you're already aware of that. Uh, you know, seasonal gas, it's mixed differently for winter than it is for summer, and a bunch of other stuff, but people fly with it. If I did it, again, I'm a very super cautious guy. If I had an uh, auto fuel STC, I might put it in my left tank and take off and land on my right tank and just use it in cruise. You can't save money, so. Now, back to magical thinking. My, I fly with a friend that has, I've had this conversation. It was fueled last week, you know. <laughs> I, uh, when I first got my airplane, it had the float gauges, and we'll talk about gauges in a minute. And uh, I went out one day and the gauge in my wings said zero. And I thought, huh, the gauge is wrong. I, I just put gas in it last night. I'll just go flying. And uh, of course, I caught myself being me. I'm a coward. I wanted to check it. So I got up on the ladder. And the fuel tank had no fuel in it. It had leaked out through the uh, gas, through the carburetor, the, the little um, something down there had leaked the entire tank out. So uh, I checked the gauges. I mean, I checked the, uh, the tanks. I actually, I do the... Um, sticking the finger in the top to make sure it's full if it's full. And I even have a, a, a dipstick to check it, even though the gauges are accurate and I have the fueling slip. Um, tanks have more fuel than the gauges are showing. That. The gauges are pretty accurate nowadays. And we'll talk about digital gauges here briefly in a minute, but, and how accurate they are. But yeah, that's not true. Um, usually what happens is you look at the gauge, you see that it's low, and you engage in this kind of thinking, but no, that's fine. It's just not telling me the truth. Anyway, I've made this far before on less. Yeah, probably with a tailwind. Maybe one will come up. And I talked about the engine burn and blah, blah, blah. Gauges. We older pilots always consider fuel gauges to be inaccurate. That's not true necessarily. Uh, my airplane are kind of inaccurate because they're the float type, but digital gauges now are very accurate up to, you know, 10th of a gallon, I hear. Um, but that's really not the point. Um, and with the airline, our gauges were not only pretty accurate, but we'd routinely stick the tanks. And there's a little, um, on the 727, it was a drip stick. There's a, they, they are on the bottom of the fuel tank and they would, anyway, they could actually physically measure the fuel in the tank. We generally only did that when there was an in-op gauge, but you could ask for that to be done. And uh, we had fueling slips. So we had a pretty good idea how much fuel we had all the time. Even if a gauge was in up, we knew uh, pretty close. So that's not irrelevant. What, what, what's relevant is what you do with the information that it's giving you, not whether it's super duper accurate or not. Because if you're flying down to a tenth of a gallon, then you probably shouldn't be flying with me. Old habit, it's a good habit. Um, hack a clock. I have a little clock and uh, looks a little bit like that. And, I hit it on takeoff and I hit it again on landing. 
I know there's taxi in and taxi out fuel, but that's not the main reason I, I hack the clock. The main reason I hack the clock is just old habit. Uh, I flew international a lot and when we'd take off, we'd hit the clock. We'd start the elapsed time and uh, we'd shut it down when we landed. And it, it's good for me because it gives me an idea um, when I'm getting ready to switch tanks, things like that. And you can, the timers now, you can, you can time individual tanks um, and it, it just helps with fuel awareness. And I know the gauges are fine, but it just, for me, it helps. Um, and timing the tanks helps me too. Um, let me see if I can, uh, let, let me talk about this just briefly a little bit more. I know we're running a little bit low, late on time, but um, when I fly cross country, I, I, I primarily use one of the computer services, you know, and I print it out because as I said, I'm a Neanderthal and I keep track of the fuel. You, you can have a how goes it on your fuel especially on a long trip and see, hey, I'm over Memphis. My fuel on this thing says I'm supposed to have 32 gallons. What do I actually have? Oh, I have 33 and a half gallons. That's good. I'm plus one and a half and I plus, put a plus one and a half. Um, there's been times uh, with the airline, of course, I did. we did this every time on long trips. There was a time uh, going to LA from uh, Cincinnati on the 7-2 that it turned out we had to stop in Phoenix because we were running that and it looked like we were going to run out of fuel because we had, turned out we had an extra hundred knot headwind that we hadn't planned. So it's just, I know it's a nitpicky thing, but it leads to fuel awareness. Um, I'm a worrywart. And if you, if you caught my last uh, webinar on holding, I went full worrywart on you guys. Uh, you can't worry enough. You don't want it to be a detriment to your flying, but you should always be thinking way ahead of what's going on. Uh, as a matter of fact, whenever you get rerouted or something happens, the very first question with you, or if you're by yourself or with your other crew members, do we have the fuel to do this? That happens a lot, if you, especially if you're going into a big city, they'll reroute the living crud out of you. And you got to figure out gee, you know, we're kind of tight on fuel and we're going to have the fuel to do this. During a relative high fuel price times, they used to give us less VFR. They called it no alternate fuel. And I think I've had to divert more for fuel in good weather than I did in bad because we would just get a hold or something next thing we know we're getting too tight on fuel. So just think ahead. Not a problem. Good old Rene there, Captain Rene Descartes. Descartes. I'm not very good at French. I only took it for four years. Uh, I've seen this. Uh, people are embarrassed to admit they don't have enough fuel or they um, get advice. Uh, I'm not saying my company did this, but I've seen guys get advice from a company <laughs> and make and not crash or anything, but just make bad decisions. They, they wanted the ground to tell them what to do. And your fuel state is your, is your deal. You're the guy that's going to slide to a stop in a cornfield if you do it wrong. So uh, it's up to you. So don't be embarrassed. Um, uh, don't be so mission focused that you can't see, you know, if you're pushing it and pushing it and pushing it, especially at night or in weather, you know, take a deep breath and go get some gas. If, if it's weather like thunderstorms and you're heading towards thunderstorms, you know, that hour you spend on the ground, maybe just enough for the weather to clear. So you don't have to worry about the silly things, or maybe they, they'll go over your head and go the other way. There's, you know, we talk about get home itis and stuff. And I've flown with, you know, the ego thing. I've flown with just plain old jerks that don't want to consider the fact they may be wrong. And you have to, if you're a crew member, you have to forcefully remind them how dumb they are in a nice way so they accept it. Um, anyway, hope you caught the joke. Took me a while. Planning is important. We, I'm hitting this a lot. But again, think about it all the time. So IFR, you're going to be holding. VFR is is the place fogged in a little bit. Am I going to have to, you know, circle this shopping mall for half an hour? When should I decide to divert? You know, at what fuel level am I going to decide to bug out and go get gas? Um, like I said, internationally, you don't have a lot of choices because you're usually over an ocean. But, you know, domestically, you might go to an airport you haven't been to before and you might really like it. You know, I'd rather, I'd rather face weather or a long delay with uh, fresh fuel you know, full fuel tanks and an empty uh, bladder and feeling better and just had a, you know, diet soda or something and worrying about it and, and just getting in with minimum fuel. Uh, older airplanes and airplanes that are out of shape, uh, different winds. Are you burning the fuel at the rate you think you're supposed to be burning it? 
And then are there ways to stretch what you have? Um, and I won't, I won't lead you to any particular products here, but um, we'll hit that slide. There's a few ways, a few ways, just be thinking about it. Generally a higher cruising altitude, if the winds are favorable, will give you better uh, gas performance. Um, you could find better winds maybe at a different altitude. Um, you know, reciprocating engines, lean. I'm a proponent of lean of peak. I know it's like a religious war. You're either uh, all for it or you're not for it. I also, uh, I forget the term, but I don't fly square. I fly oh, over square I, in airplanes like 182s or stuff like that. I, I'll fly I'll fly over square. Um, it was good enough for Lindbergh. He, he did it in World War II and taught the P-38 guys and they had the range to go um, take on Yamamoto. Slowing down gives you better fuel mileage a little, sometimes depending on your aircraft. Direct routing, uh, you know, we all have GPSs and, you know, you if you don't already have direct routing, uh, which is easier to get nowadays, but you're on you're on a route that is kind of convoluted. Every now and then, you could just gently ask ATC if you can go direct someplace that takes miles off your route. Keep in mind, it's not always the most efficient based on winds, and a lot of times ATC will turn you down because it's actually going to slow you down. You know, if you're uh, going direct, they may have to slow you or or vector you a lot. So it's not always the best, but it's certainly worth asking for. Um, in the very, very old days, I know I'm telling a lot of stories, but we would take off from, we do the all nighter from LA to Atlanta in the 7-2. And as soon as we got to center heading eastbound, we generally say something like, hey, we're heading bug equipped. How about um, 089 direct Rome, Rome arrival? And usually, you know, two in the morning, they'd laugh and give it to you. So it's not hard to get direct reading. Um, I can't say this enough, and I've, I've said it a lot, and I've always said it about me, and so far I've been lucky. You don't want to be the person that runs out of fuel. Um, it's just embarrassing, especially, like I said, the overflying gas stations. It's just not worth doing. Um, I, I don't know how I could tell you more than it just, it just makes you look bad. And uh, I'm trying to remember if I have that here. No, I don't. I had, <laughs> I took it out. It was, it was a slide in poor taste because I remember one of the military guys I flew with uh, once telling me it's, it's better to die than to look bad. And uh, of course it was, he was joking, I hope, but uh, I think people think that way. Sometimes they just don't want to look bad. They don't want to look bad in front of their passengers or their spouse or the other crew or whatever. Now, professional crews, I've never really run into that much. I mean, we're, the reason we've survived so long is we're just big giant chickens and uh, we don't, we don't get paid. We didn't get paid any more for pushing bad weather or making bad uh, fuel decisions uh, or closer fuel decisions than we did just being very conservative. Actually, we got paid more. We got paid by the minute. So if we flew a little extra to get the job done safely, we got paid more. It's a good deal. Uh, I hope I covered this kind of for you guys. I know it's not real specific, I think if I went through the main points, I'd want you to remember that, um, you know, what's the old joke? You can't have enough fuel. You can't have too much fuel unless you're on fire. Let me see, the other one was three things you don't want are uh, air above you, runway behind you, or fuel left on the ground. Uh, I have one about a captain watching a sucker burn, but I'll go into that. But anyway, uh, you know, when in doubt, put fuel on board. It's almost every accident I can think of recently, you know, it's just bad things can happen to you in the air, but don't do it to yourself. And with that, I'll leave it open to questions. And I think Kent's going to step back in. And if we have questions, I hope you do. I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you for coming. I uh, hope you enjoyed my office. And again, I'm sorry I couldn't see you guys, but thank you. Great, great. Um, yeah, I, it was a great presentation. I think fuel is one of those things that people, I mean, obviously in our arena, pilots know to be safe. Don't take it for granted. You know, and you brought up a lot of good points of the get their itis. Don't, don't do that. I know Steve Ells has mentioned that too. Just be safe, be a smart pilot. Um, not, you don't have to, one doesn't have to be a hero. So um, <clears throat> there's a question here uh, from Merrick who says, any advice on fueling from your days as a line boy? <laughs> yes, yes, actually, 
I guess we can hear me. I'm, yeah, my little microphone's turning green, so I guess you can hear me. Yeah. Let me think here. And not being facetious or any other funny, hard to spell word, um, I do remember, and I still do this. I don't see other people do this a lot. Uh, high wing airplanes, I put the fuel hose over my shoulder and walk up the ladder with it over my shoulder. That way I don't end up scraping the top of the customer's wing with the fuel nozzle because you're bound to lose control of it at some point. And I want to get high enough I can see down into the tank so I don't blurp 10 gallons of fuel over their wing. Uh, see, I mentioned the ground wire. Uh, I mentioned that it's a good idea to turn the truck off before you change fuel nozzles. Um, oh, here's one that I, I hadn't mentioned. If you're looking, you get, and I've read this in different POHs, if you have the kind of airplane that had, and most of us do fly this kind of airplane, that has left, right, or both for fuel selection, it, I, this actually works. I've tested it out. Before you fuel the airplane, put it in left or right, not both. That way, when you're fueling one tank, it doesn't transfer to the other. It's, it, it, if you really are filling up, I've, I think that's the way you really fill up. I don't know how much it is, but you'll get some more fuel in the airplane. And uh, I won't say tip your line crew. Uh, oh, um, don't get mad if they show up a little bit late because uh, a lot of times they're busy where they're like me, they're under a wing, you know, BSing with somebody, but fueling it yourself. I can't think of much of anything else. Okay. Oh, oh, the fuel, uh, the fuel hose, if you're self-serve and you're retracting the fuel hose, put your foot over it when you're retracting it. So it doesn't just go wild and go flopping around and you can get it on the, a lot of people jam the fuel hose and the, in the, um, the retract thing. And it's just, we'd always do that. We put our leg over it when, when we were doing fuel trucks. It's the same thing. Anyway, okay. that's pretty much it. You had another one from Doug, Doug Fisher. Um, Doug has a 1960 a Cessna 180 Charlie. It came with extended range tanks. No information on quote unquote usable fuel quantity. What is the best way to, de to determine unusable gallons? Oh my goodness. Um, let me think. That'd be a good question for a mechanic because I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of a way if you filled them up and you burned them down. Honest to goodness, don't know. It seems like if it didn't come with paperwork, that's hard. It seems like it would be in the paperwork. I'm sorry, I can't be helpful there, honestly. No, th th that is a good question. And I'm, I'm thinking, Doug, if you have our email, um, send that email to me with the serial number so I know exactly. And I can forward this over to Steve or... Uh, um, uh, Kristen on this one. It's one of those things. And if you happen to know the manufacturer of the tanks too, maybe I can do a little, a little bit of uh, research and see if we can get some more information for you. Um, let's see here. Mark has, or Mary, I'm sorry, Mary has a question. Mary McEnroe. Uh, I tried to fuel at my destination last Saturday and uh, the credit card machine didn't work. We flew to a nearby airport and thankfully it worked there. When I returned, I posted the information on the pilot Facebook group, and we heard from pilots in a variety of areas on the West Coast about the same issue at airports they visited. Was there a network outage, something to keep in mind for contingency planning since many airports aren't staffed? Yeah, um, actually that came up here recently. Um, I've had that happen where, and I've just always, I'm, I'm sure Mary tried this, just use another credit card. I've had it where it won't read my MasterCard, but it'll read my whatever. But uh, that doesn't sound like that's what happened to her. But here, um, Georgetown Airport in north of Lexington, um, they have self-serve fuel and it was down for, I don't know how long, a week or two. And they checked it mechanically and it was a network problem. Apparently there was another Georgetown Airport somewhere. I know there's one in Texas. I imagine every state has a Georgetown. And the computer thought, got it mixed up and thought our Georgetown was the one in Texas or whatever. So if you put it in your credit card and asked for fuel, it wouldn't give it to you because it thought you were lying that you were 800 miles away. So it couldn't sell you fuel. Oh. So <laughs> I don't know how to mitigate that other than call ahead. Um, okay. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Okay. I, I lost reception a little bit there from you, Kevin, but I'm going to move forward probably able to uh, catch up here. Um, uh, let's see here. Oh, uh, Wings Credit. Uh, Drew had asked a question and 
the wings credit this conversation from Kevin is applicable for the wings credit and Jen has put the wings credit information in the chat box so uh, take a look at the chat box you'll see a link there um, and she also had put in there SICE's information that you'll see SICE is a extremely accurate digital uh, sending unit to, to, to quantify the amount of uh, fuel you have left in the in the in the tanks. Uh, let's see here, Mary Drew, and Mary said that she had tried three cards um, from two different people and it didn't work. Um, at this moment, Mary, it looks like we may have lost reception from Kevin, but. Uh, obviously, this is some kind of a problem with some maybe local FBOs, or as Kevin had stated, maybe it's a internal thing that um, maybe just the FBO. Who knows? It could have been a, a, a server was down for their Wi-Fi. I, I don't know. It seems a little odd, but you know, Kevin had a good point. Maybe just call ahead to make sure everything's working fine um, and just have enough fuel to get to the next place, I guess. Um, and Doug Fisher has a FYI. He said, I found out the hard way, 98 gallons total. The engine went silent with 13.5 gallons in the tanks. He had been told it was six gallons, was deliverable, was deliberately trying to determine unusable. So it was, it was a downwind and it made a great quiet landing. Hopefully this is useful to others. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, that's good to know, obviously. Um, for those with tip tanks, they most of the people with tip tanks know what their uh, quantity is. But for those that have purchased a plane with tip tanks that are not aware of it, um, if you're looking for some technical advice on that, send me an email. I'd be happy to look into it for you. Um, I don't always have the answer, but I can go sometimes to technical publications and find uh, text on technical publications and get some answers for you there. Um, or if I have the manufacturer of the tanks, if it's in your logbooks of who installed them, uh, I can uh, do some research there as well. Uh, I know Steve Ells is a great wealth of knowledge with some of these old tidbits of information. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. It looks like we're done with our Q&A box. Uh, Michael Riley had a question at Cherokee 6, four separate tanks. How old is too old for fuel in the tanks? Never fully emptied full tanks. Um, in the chat box, we agree. Da, da, da. You know, at this moment, uh, we have lost Kevin. We're not sure why. Um, but what we can do, Michael, you've got a couple questions and another Michael in here, actually we have three, two Michaels here. If you guys want to take these questions, email them to me. I'll forward them over to Kevin. Be happy to do that and answer these for you. Um, it'd probably take about a day or two, uh, not a problem. Uh, and my email, I don't see it, but it's it's Kent, Kent like Superman, Kent at aviationgroupltd.com. Send me your questions in an email and we'll get the answers for you. That's uh, easy to do. Uh, like I said, a little technical problem with Kevin and the reception right now, but um, it's kind of like what happened with Mary and a credit card. Um, but I think that is about it. Let's see here. Uh, if anyone has trouble getting the WINGS credit, please contact Jen. And Jen's email is jen at aviationgroupltd. And mine is kent at aviationgroupltd.com for those that have questions that we did not have a chance to answer because Kevin uh, had uh, fallen off the radar here. Um, but, you know, things happen, no, no big deal. Uh, Jen does have the link. Again, if you have problems, reach out to Jen. And she also has SICE Corporation. Uh, SICE is a supporter with Piper Flyer and Cessna Flyer, but they have this, um, I, 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 gosh, I want to see electromagnetic, but that's not it. Uh, they have this new technology that, uh, that's been out for a couple of years now that's in OEMs and, and, and such, but it's highly, highly accurate down to, I believe, a tenth of a gallon for uh, fuel uh, uh, qualifying or qu quantity. Um, and, and Jen has it there in the, uh, in, in the chat box. If you don't have a chance to write this down, just send me an email and say, hey, Kent, what was that company that has these new 
uh, fuel uh, uh, quantifiers. Um, I'll send you uh, Scott's information. He'll be happy to talk to you about uh, if your airframe is, uh, has, is applicable for that. Um, let's see here. What else do we have? The YouTube channels. Jen has that posted. The Cessna Flyer. I'm Pecker back. Flyer YouTube. Oh, there's Kevin again. There he's back. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what happened. My internet worked and um, oh, I don't know. That, but that's I okay. Guess, that, that's okay. okay. We were addressing a few things here. We got a couple of little uh, additional housekeeping things done here. Okay, um, it's funny. Yeah. I was just making fun of computers and my computer clicked off. I wonder if that was, you know, yeah. it well, heard me or something. You know, yeah, no problem. Um, actually, one of them, let's see here. I wanted to go back to one of them. My, it's funny because with Mary having, Mary actually came back and said that they tried three card credit cards and it, and, and from two different people and it didn't work. And I said, it could be a network thing and here, all of a sudden we lost you. And it, it happens, <laughs> you know, it's kind of ironic. I guess it's just yeah. proof in the pudding that things do happen. Well, I basically um, have a wood burning server out here in the country, but it was working. I just, that's, you know. that's right, that's all right. Um, and Doug Fisher said, he gave a little FYI. He said he found it the hard way. Uh, he has 98 gallons total. Mm -hmm. um, the engine went silent at 13.5 gallons left in the tanks. And he had been told it was about six gallons, um, but they landed down a wind and it was very silent when they landed. But um, obviously he's here to tell about the story, which is a good thing. But I guess it's, I, you know, it goes back to the thing of, you know, You've got your old school thing of your timer that you used to do years back. It's not mm -hmm. a bad thing. It's a, it's a it's a good redundant backup system. Mm -hmm. It worked for you. It worked then. It works now. Uh, we have SICE with extremely accurate measurements. We have all all the additional things that you brought up in this conversation about you know don't don't have the get there itis. Just be safe. You'd rather be a safe pilot than a, a what was a, a brave pilot or the, what was the I forgot the military thing uh reference you made with uh you know it, it's it's better to be a oh better to die than look bad that one yeah yeah it's, you know yeah. Just, just be safe i mean this is really the message of this whole thing is be safe and you did a great job with this so yeah um well, i'm sorry that happened to him i can't you know, figure that out but yeah yeah i always uh, try to land i wrote this down i don't think i mentioned it I, and again i'm a big wuss but i always i always want to land with 45 minutes in the tank. I want to be touching down with 45 minutes in the tank, mm -hmm. more, more better an hour or more, <laughs> but right. you know, but anyway, I know, I know that's not always possible. And a lot of people are weight limited uh, on takeoff based on landing and stuff like and the load they're carrying and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. anyway. And I, I, I do have a, a question for you, Kevin, on, on fuel is let's say you go to, uh, you're fueling up and you've done it a hundred times in your Cessna and someone switched, you know, some, for some unknown reason, you had one or two gallons of a different av gas that went, or different uh, gas that went into the wings. What do you do if, the, I'll, call, I'll call it cross-contamination, what do you do if it's one gallon only, you know? Oh gosh, that'd be a good question for Steve, but I, it personally, you know, if it's, of course, 80 is not available. If it's, you know, two different kinds of av gas, I'd probably, you know, Okay, FAA, turn yourself off. I'd go with it if it was a gallon or two. If it's jet fuel, no, I wouldn't. But I think it's heavier anyway. It would tend to migrate toward the inlet. Um, if the way I understand it is correct. Okay. And uh, yeah, that's that's a tough one, but it'd be really hard to do that. But if you did do it, if it was two different kinds of, if it was, you mixed, um, oh, I don't know, boy, I don't even want to go down that road. Should you put two gallons of car gas in there to get going? Probably not. Um, right. Would your insurance pay for that? Post crash, if they found out you put unapproved fuel in your airplane, right? If it, are there no hotels in the country you can go to and get a steak dinner and go to bed and figure it out in the morning? I right. mean, it's, true, true. I always, I, I always look in. This is non-fuel, but I always look at decisions like that. And first of all, is it going to matter in ten years if I get home now and go with this fuel? Probably nobody's going to remember in ten years, including me, that this happened. And that the most important one is how's it going to go when I'm sitting at the hearing in the hearing room <laughs> and I have to explain myself assuming I survived the crash in front of a judge and the jury of my peers or whatever uh, how am I going to what am I going what kind of testimony am I going to be able to give you know did, did you do this well yeah okay yeah. why well because I felt like it I felt like it was okay <laughs>
uh, oh, anyway. Th th there's a gentleman named uh, Merrick who has just a comment. It's not really a question. He says, he has a friend who ran out of gas using the time method, but forgot to lean the mixture. Yeah, that'll do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a huge difference. I'd, I'd have to, um, um, I think in the comment, in the question section, I can mention, I, I kind of adhere to, there's a guy named Mike Bush and you're probably aware of him. Um, and he does some good work on that. Mm -hmm. uh, leaning, I lean, uh, and again, just because I do it doesn't mean you guys have to, but even in my little airplane, I lean taxiing out. I, I get it to where it's almost running rough taxiing out. And it's, I think it keeps my spark plugs a little cleaner. I don't think it saves much fuel. Um, and I lean probably out of a thousand, I usually don't get much above a thousand feet and I lean it at a thousand feet. Mm -hmm. um, certainly if you're 7,500 feet, you should lean it. So yeah, it's a huge difference in fuel flow where you just leave it rich. If you're flying an air coupe or something that doesn't have mixture, of course you can't lean it, but I, those are few and far between nowadays. But mm -hmm. yeah, it does yeah. make a difference. And, and uh, Michael uh, Tamales has another question. He said, he, this gentleman, he, Michael says that um, I always check visually the tanks. He's, mm -hmm. he's got a Saratoga with an inboard and outboard tanks mm -hmm. and uh, wing gauges. On the inboard tanks, it shows 35 gallons. Recently acquired, is there any way to know how much fuel is in the outboard tanks if it's not a visible from the neck? Hmm. Well, you couldn't dipstick it. I'm not aware of a way. That's another good Steve question. I'm not aware of a way if you can't stick it and you can't see it. And it is on that airplane that would be pretty common, I would think. Mm -hmm. I don't, don't those airplanes have tabs like at a certain level it reaches a tab and then but if you can't see the fuel I honestly don't see a way you can measure it other than the gauge right or or a mathematical um oh I hate to say run a tank dry we used to run tanks dry all the time just to make sure we got all the fuel out of you right. can drain the tank and fill it up with different levels of fuel and see where where it is you know if you go oh, that would be one thing drain the fuel you know, I'd burn most of the fuel first. So you don't have to waste a lot of money draining it. Right. And then at the airport, you know, put five gallons in it. See if you can see it Then put 10 gallons. Can I see it yet? Yeah. Oh, okay. 15 and a half gallons. I can actually see fuel. So when I don't see fuel, I know it's below 15 and a half gallons. Mm -hmm. That'd be my only advice. But, right. But, right. Yeah. right. Um, let's see. Uh, the same gentleman, Michael says that his Sierra took, has 107, 107 gallon total capacity, including unusable. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, Michael has a question, Michael Riley, when is fuel in a tank too old? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think, oh, how old is old in Avgas? I know that that's a problem with the auto fuel STC is that that fuel um, breaks down faster and doesn't have a good shelf life. Um, and Avgas, I, I know it can be quite a while. Um, when I re, when we rebuilt my airplane, we had a little bit of fuel in the tanks, and we actually um, we didn't burn it. We we cleaned it. That's one part of the rebuild. We drained the tanks, but when we drained it, it looked like regular gas. It wasn't gummy or dirty or anything like that. That'd be a good question to look up a manufacturer like an Avgas manufacturer I'm sure their literature mm -hmm. would have that like if it's been in the hangar all winter is it still good I think it is um the the petrochemical people I talked about that were in Houston told me that but I can't come out and say for sure um mm -hmm. to this gentleman yeah. but um anyway I don't think it goes bad it, it certainly doesn't you know evaporate to the point where it's more concentrated or anything like that so yeah, I, I, I think Shell, I think Shell has like a, a, a Q&A thing that anybody can post a question on their website, kind of like oil or, or uh, petroleum, you know, just kind of one of those questions, like, which is a good question. I, it's an excellent question, yeah, yeah especially after right. COVID with everybody not flying as much. And, yeah, uh, yeah. So um, let's see here. I think we've answered the questions. I'm looking at the um, chat box. Mm -hmm. uh, we covered the things that we needed to cover there. 
mentioned Saiz about this as being uh, applicable for the FAA wings. If anyone has questions, uh, reach out to us. We'll, get, we'll make sure of that. Okay. Um, and then the YouTube channels, I think we're pretty much covered with that. I, I Yeah, excellent. Okay. I see, see, we have people here. I want to thank you guys again for coming. I know it's weird being at a webinar, but it's also easy because none of you had to climb in a car or, or travel or anything like that. So I really appreciate you showing up and I hope it helped you a little bit mm -hmm. or, or yeah. at least helped fill the time for an hour. But I uh, hope, hope something I said got through and uh, it wasn't a deeply complex subject, but it's nice to talk about this stuff every now and then. So thank you. Yeah, safety. That's the biggest thing. I, that's the message that I got. And that's what this is all about, being being safe, being smart, and taking the precautions when you're fueling and, and measuring and and uh, calculating. You know, that's what people have to do. You know, don't don't be anxious. So um, we thank you, Kevin, for being here tonight and everybody else that joined us and for, for being here. And uh, this will be put on YouTube in a few days. We'll get it uh, put up there. So um, again, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. We appreciate that. And uh, Kevin will be here for another webinar. I think next week we have something else scheduled with Kevin. Right, next Should month. Next, next month it'll be on weather, I think. So. Right, which I think will be another uh, wings credit thing also. So mm -hmm. um, uh, again, thank you everyone and have a good evening and we will talk later. Bye everybody. Bye guys. <laughs>